Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Happy first Sunday in January. It's good to see all of your smiling faces this morning. For those of you who don't know, my name is Stephen, and I would like to welcome you to the Central Baptist Church. If you wouldn't mind, let's all stand, and we'll sing a couple songs here to get started.
should be our goal, right? Christ be exalted alone. Thank you. Once again, it's a uh, great time we've already had this morning of singing and preparing our hearts for uh, the message that I believe that uh, God has given me this morning to to pass along. Um, Thank you, Jonathan. Appreciate it. Uh, We are going to be in the book of Matthew chapter 22. It's a very familiar passage to us. Uh, we're going to be we're going to read verses 34 through 40. 
uh, eventually, and then, you know, a bunch of other verses, as I tend to do. Um, but last week, we talked about running the race that God had, has prepared for each and every one of us. We talked in the book of Hebrews and, and how that, uh, first off, we need to prepare to cast off the weights that we carry, those things that may seemingly be good in our life, but that distract us from what God has for us, that maybe take away our focus, our attention. Uh, we talked about the Krispy Kreme hot and ready donut sign, you know, those things that distract us, that cause us to go, ooh, maybe we should stop there. Uh, and we also talked about how that we should cast off those sins that easily beset us, those things that um, trip us up, that tangle our feet up, you know, the untied shoelaces maybe. I don't know, it didn't come up with a great analogy for that one, but it works. Um, those things that slow us down, that take us off. So we got to prepare, first of all, for this race. Then the second thing we need to do is we need to have a plan. Now, God already has a plan for us, right? We talked about that and how that when before we were even born, when we were just a, a baby in our mother's womb, that God knew us and that he had a plan for us and that he has set this path before us for to run. And so we need to follow the plan that God has given us. So first we need to prepare. Second, we need to follow that plan that Christ has, had, had, has presented before us. And then lastly, we need to pursue Jesus. That third P is pursue, pursue Jesus. Keep our focus and attention on Christ and what he has. He's the author. He's the finisher of our life. He's the one that has prepared everything. He, he's sovereign. He's in charge. He has everything for us. And so we spent a lot of time talking about those things last week, and we talked about uh, being evangelistic, right? One of those big uh, doctrinal kind of words that doesn't appear in the Bible, but we like to talk about. Um, but it is an important thing that we do. It, it is presenting our testimony, uh, our personal witness, um, sharing the gospel of Christ to those around us, whether we know anything about them or not. Always being ready, as Paul talks about when we talk, you know, Romans, that the, the big thing in Romans that we've been talking about. Paul saying, I am ready to share the gospel. Always be, uh, be being prepared for that. Well, today we're going to talk about, like I said, our, our theme for the year of 2024. Uh, love God, love others. Now, we spent a lot of time, like I said, over this last year talking about the love of God. John, in the book of 1 John and in the Gospel of John, spends a lot of time talking about God's love. And in our passage today, Jesus is going to talk about God's love. And then uh, uh, Brother Curtis, when he did the revival message, he really talked about one of his passages, one of his uh, um, messages was about love God, love others. And so it's been a burden on my heart um, all year long. And then especially over the last couple months, it's been something that, you know, I think God has really um, been dealing with me on and how that uh, as a church, as individuals, uh, as people that know Christ, well, Jesus says it himself in this passage, there's two commandments and we're going to talk about them. So this has been something that has been uh, dear on my heart. So we'll go ahead and we'll read Matthew 22 verses 34 through 40. But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him, saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the laws and all the prophets. So just take a second to think about that. We often think, you know, what would, what would we ask Jesus? And maybe our question for Jesus is, Jesus, what's the most important thing? What's the most important thing that we can do? And he answered it for us. 
Love God. Love others. The Pharisees were the keepers of the law, right? They were the religious zealots. They were the ones that knew the most about the Old Testament. And they had uh, classified over 600 laws. It's a lot of laws. I imagine the United States, I don't know how many we have in the United States, but probably more than 600. I don't know, definitely more than 600 pages. But 600 laws was a lot of laws. And they were hanging out there, and one of their topics of conversation was always which one's more important. You know, just like us, right? Which one's the most important thing? We all have preferences in our life, right? We all have things that we would prefer. We have uh, ways that, you know, people standing up here should look. We have ways that people in church services should act. We have ways that, you know, we all have preferences. And there's nothing wrong with necessarily having preferences. But the Pharisees tried to take their preferences and make them part of what thou shalt. And so it became an issue. But they're standing around, they're talking about this. They had just seen the Sadducees shut up, right? So in that previous passage, Jesus had shut down the Sadducees. And so they were so sad, you see. Fred's shaking his head, but I knew I could get some laughs out of that one. They were so sad because Jesus had just shut them down. I think Sue taught me that song. (laughs) I don't want to be a Sadducee. I don't know. We'll sing that later. Maybe that'll be the closing invitation song. What do you guys think? But they're sitting around talking, and they just saw the Sadducees get shut down, and so they're like, all right, well, let's take a run at this guy. So they find that they have one lawyer, right? There's always one lawyer in the group, right? There's always one guy that is the best arguer, that every time there's any kind of confrontation or any kind of conversation in the synagogue, you send that guy, and he can shut everybody down because he knows the best arguments, he knows the best way to attack arguments and and so they get this guy and they go all right now I, you go do this so this is so he went forward and and he asked Jesus this question to try to trip him up he wanted to tempt him it says it was trying to get him to say something that they could attack him on right they were trying to do something that uh, wasn't pleasing obviously um, but they were more concerned about the outward appearance right They cared more about what it looked like than what was on the inside. And so he asked Jesus, what's your favorite commandment? Now before we get there, we're going to see that Jesus in the next passage actually describes the scribes and Pharisees as people that care more about what the outside looks like. They care more about the fact that they're wearing Bible verses and that they looked all haughty and proud and that they were proper and that they didn't break any of those 600 commandments. And so in Matthew 23, 27, sorry, I tricked you, didn't I? Matthew 23, 27, Jesus says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Now, the lawyers were the scribes. They were the ones that wrote the law down, that did all those kind of, that knew the most. And so he's, a, he's talking to these two groups of people. And he doesn't pull any punches, does he? Calls them hypocrites right off the bat. For ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Jesus knew what this Pharisee was up to. And this Pharisee was trying to trick him up. He said, you're like a whited sepulcher. You're like a tomb that has been painted beautifully on the outside. Maybe there's a nice little mountain, Bob Ross mountain sculpture painted real nice on the outside. But when you open up that door, there ain't nothing in there but death and uncleanness. You put on a good show. You act like you care. You act like you're doing what God would have for you to do. But on the inside, you don't have a heart for God. On the outside, you know the words to say. You know the proper place to go, places to sit, place, things to do, things to say. But on the inside, your heart, it ain't for God. You're a hypocrite. And so Jesus, when asked this question, Jesus gives an answer. And I love the fact that Jesus doesn't hesitate, right? He goes right to it. Sometimes he doesn't answer their questions. 
Sometimes when he knows that they're asking questions, he'll ask them a question in response. I keep messing Lisa up up there. I act like I'm going to go to the verse, and then I just go the other direction. Sometimes he ignores their question and says, all right, I'll take your question and give you a better question that will reveal your heart. But in this one, he doesn't hesitate. He goes and he quotes from Deuteronomy. He quotes from Deuteronomy chapter number 6, verses 4 and 5. And he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. So Jesus quotes part of the law. And now this part of the scripture that he quotes here, uh, is in, it's the Jewish prayer Shema. I think I pronounced it right. I don't know. I tried to listen on the Googles, but Shema, Shema, Shema. Pretty sure it's Shema. Uh, and it was a very familiar prayer. In fact, many of the religious Judaism, people that believe in Judaism, they would say that prayer, it it was a commandment, that they should say the prayer with their eyes eyes covered every day. It was a prayer that everyone knew and everyone said. So it was very familiar to them. So it probably wasn't a terrible shock that he heard this. And when Jesus says, this is the first and great commandment, this is it. This is the most important thing that you can do. And probably that Pharisee was like, duh, I could have answered that one. Check. That's what we do sometimes, right? We're just worried more about a checklist. Like, yeah, that's what I do that. Now, Jesus later tells him, now, you don't do that. You act like you do that, but you don't really know what that means. You're a hypocrite. So Jesus continued quoting. He went back to the law. And this time he went to Leviticus, chapter number 19, verse 18. And he says in Leviticus 19, Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. This is God speaking to the children of Israel. And Jesus is quoting this. And he says, the first great one is love God. And then the second one, like unto it, very close. If you do the first one, the second one's going to happen naturally. That's how he could tell the Pharisees were whited sepulchers. Because they did the first one on the outside. But there was no second one in their life. So he knew that inside was nothing but dead. But now he, he could read their heart too. He had a little bit of advantage over than we do. But he, it was obvious you're just full of uncleanness and dead men's bones. You're a hypocrite. You're not, you don't really love your neighbor as yourself. And just so you know that this is a passage that is important, Romans chapter 13, verse 9. Paul wrote about it too. For this, he lists the Ten Commandments, all of these commandments. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. And if there be any commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Paul's writing to the church at Rome. And he's saying, I'm going to quote Jesus, who is quoting Jesus. (laughs) He also talks about it in Galatians. He writes to the church in Galatians. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 14. For all of the law, all of those 600 commandments, the ones that God gave and even the ones that the Pharisees added by their own evilness, by their own hardness of their hearts, all of the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You guys get in the picture? This is important. James Jesus' little brother. (laughs) Can you imagine having Jesus as your big brother? Probably stressful. But James, in chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, he says, If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Ye do well. But if you have respect to persons, you commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. 
So James takes it a little bit further. James is a great book of Christian living. He does a great job of telling you how to do it right, how to follow Jesus. He knows what it looks like because while Jesus was here, he was living with him and he was like, that guy's crazy. He, he ain't anybody special. And then as soon as Jesus died and then he came back, he resurrected, he's like, mm, maybe, there, maybe this is something I should pay attention to. Maybe my big brother's not as crazy as I think he is. And he takes it a little bit step further. He says, if you say you love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But how many of you that say that are really a respecter of persons? How many of you put your personal preferences over loving someone? James said, man, my whole life I recited that prayer. My whole life leading up to knowing Jesus in a real way, not just being his brother. I lived my whole life knowing that prayer, knowing that I should love God and love my neighbor as myself. But that whole time I was a respecter of persons. I was thinking that what you did, where you went, what you said, what you wore, the way you behaved was more important than what was on the inside. I committed sin. Love thy neighbor as thyself. When we lose our motivation to love our neighbors, James says, you're sinning. You're convicted of the law because you have transgressed that law of God to love your neighbor as yourself. When you lose sight of that, when you become critical, think back to conversations last week. Okay, think back to conversations yesterday. Think of conversations you had this morning. Was there any uh, criticalness in that conversation about the people around you? Or were you loving? I won't answer. I think we all know our propensity to be critical. Because we have this human nature thing in us that we have a disjointed view of ourselves and other people. When we do something, we act like we know the motivations behind what we do it. And even if it's wrong, maybe not the best, we know we did it out of a loving heart. At least that's what we tell ourselves. We think our motivations are always pure. But when somebody else does something, we know what they were thinking too. We know why they did that. We know their motivation to do that, and it was just to be mean to me. It was just to treat me bad. It was just to make me look stupid. It's our human, it's our human nature. It's our tendency as humans to do. We think that we can judge everyone else's motives, including ours, and we can't. God is the judger of that. When we look critically on other people, when we are a respecter of persons, we aren't showing the love of God, and we aren't doing what he would have for us to do. John 3.16, a, pop, a popular, popular verse. I, I quote it a lot, but it's an important one. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What better way to show the love of God to your neighbor than John 3.16? Telling your neighbor about the love of God. Telling those that you are around that, hey, this God that you've heard about, this Jesus, he came to this earth and died a horrible death, a shameful death, a very public beating, nasty death. And he did that. He left being God. <laughs> he left heaven to come here to do that so that he could fix the relationship that you messed up, that I messed up by choosing sin over God. He did that for us. That's how much he loves us. And so Jesus says, he says, 
God loved you so much that he sent me down here to live and die and be resurrected so that you can live. So that you don't have to experience hell. That's the love of God. And if we're not willing to share that love of God with others, we're not loving our neighbors. You got that old saying that says, preach the gospel at all times and use words when necessary. Nope. (laughs) That ain't it. It's important to live the gospel. I'm not going to take away from that. But is the great commandment, go and live like you love Jesus and don't tell anybody about it? Nope. Romans 10, 14 says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How can somebody call on Jesus if they haven't believed in him? And how shall they believe in him who have, they, who have not heard? How are they supposed to call on Jesus if they've never heard of him? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Now, I know today I'm the preacher. But when we go out that door, we're all preachers. He goes on in verse 15. And how shall they preach except they be sent? How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Matthew 28, 18. We'll go straight to that one, which is the Great Commission. And Jesus came and said unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Amen. Going back to Romans chapter 15, it says, How shall they preach except they be sent? And then going straight to Matthew 28. Go ye therefore. How can they hear without a preacher? How can the preacher go if he hasn't been sent? And then Jesus says, go. Like I said, right now I'm the preacher. I'm the guy standing up here three steps higher. But when we all go out that door, we're all preachers. We all have that directive from God. If you've accepted Christ as your Savior, you have that directive from God to go. Not go and live a life that people might be able to see Jesus possibly at some point. It's to go and preach. Share that gospel message. You say you love God. Are you showing it by your love for others? We say that we believe Jesus has all power in heaven and the earth. We act like we know what he wants us to do. But when we go out that door, we don't follow the directive. It's not just living right. It's teaching. It's baptizing. Why aren't we teaching? Why aren't we baptizing? Is it because we're not loving our neighbors like we should? This is a tough one for me. This has been something that has been bothering me for some time. And I hope that God is working on your heart like he's working on mine. Because that's our goal this year. Should be our goal all the time. But we're going to be intentional about it coming up. Love God. Love others. And we can't love others unless we're willing to be weird. Are you willing? To, I, I'm looking out there. I know some of you are willing to be weird. Are you willing to be weird in the way that Jesus has called you to be weird? To go? To teach? To preach? To baptize? Because let me tell you, Jesus is in charge. 
He's living inside of us, and he has all the power. So what are we worried about? We worried about being uncomfortable. We worried about people being around us that might be a little bit weirder than we are, we think. I don't know, it's holding us back. What's keeping us from doing what the Lord would have for us to do? We have a clear message. We have a clear path. Love God, love others. Now, we have out there our family calendar. And we also have our church calendar. Did anybody get these on your way in? Some people? A few people got them? Well, if you didn't get them, make sure you get them on the way out. Um, some of the stuff is things that you know, right? Things that we always do every year. Uh, the, the, the norms, we're, we're going to continue to do those norms. But this calendar here is called the family calendar. And this is something that um, I really have been thinking and praying about for some time. Uh, but once a month at least, we want to do some sort of event, some sort of thing here, uh, either in the church or on the property somewhere, where we are intentional about inviting people to come. Right? We've been pretty successful with this in the past. We, we've done a decent job of getting people on campus. Right? We've got people to come to the Fall Family Fest. That's a good time. We've had people to come to the back to school night. We've had people come into um, the Easter egg hunt and on down the line. We can list all the things that we've done and, and they're good things. But what we really need to focus on as individuals and as a church is not just getting them here, but preaching. Sharing the love of God. Now don't get a microphone on and come up on the stage and go, all right, everybody sit down. Some of that is lifestyle, right? Some of that is just conversation. And it's not always easy, but leading conversation to Jesus is something that we need to be intentional about. That's something that we need to practice. That's something that we need to do. We, that's the only way we truly show the love of God, is by loving others, by telling them about Christ. Next Sunday night is a good place to start. Now we're getting a late jump on inviting people, so we'll see. We'll trust that the Lord will, will supply. But invite people to that. Come to that. I know that there are people in here that don't like to do things that make them feel uncomfortable. And it might be a little bit uncomfortable for you to go down in the gym building and sit at a table with people that you don't know and play Monopoly. All right, I won't make you play Monopoly. That one's a long one. We'll go with something quicker. Connect Four. I don't know. Do we even have Connect Four? I don't know. The Young Married class is, is organizing this, and they got games. It might be weird to be at church and be down in the gym and playing a card game. I, I know that that's something that, you know, the purebred Baptists from way back when would never condemn. But we're not going to be gambling. Don't worry. We ain't going to do anything bad. But we need to be here loving our neighbors, sharing the love of Christ with those that don't have God. And we can't do that unless we show up and engage people in conversation and show them God's love. We can't do that in an hour sitting here in the sanctuary on Sunday morning or for an hour Sunday evening. We got to go. We got to find people. We got to preach. In February, it's going to be the Valentine's party, parents' night out. I'm going to be honest with you. Some of these things I just put down on a piece of paper, and I'm trusting you all are going to figure out the details. So as you look at these papers, I need help. I don't need just help with, like, organizing. I need ideas, too. What does that look like? Now, probably two or three hours, depending, you know, probably three hours of hanging out with a bunch of kids that might be crazy, so that their parents can go out and do something. And we can have a good time with the kids. We can teach them. We can share Bible stories. We can play games. We can teach your appreciation night. That's one in May. 
I have no earthly idea what we're going to do to appreciate teachers. But I know we have some teachers in here, so they probably tell us how they want to be appreciated. We have a craft night. Not a clue what kind of craft we're going to make. But we're going to do it. And we're going to invite people. And we're going to get people in this building, in that building, in the parking lot, on the playground. And we're going to need to show them the love of God when they're here. The only way the kingdom of God grows is by sharing the love of God. We can get people from every church in the city coming here because I'm such an eloquent speaker. Oh, come on, that's not what you're supposed to laugh at. <laughs> but what good is that? Are you increasing the kingdom of God? How do you do it? Jesus told us, I have all the power, go and preach. He didn't even say you got to convince them, you got to convert them. He said, go tell them. The power of the gospel is in my words, Jesus said. In the work that I did on the cross, Jesus said. They're not in the words that you guys say. The power is in the gospel message of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And all you got to do is share it. All I have to do is share it. But that's what we need to do. We need to show up. We need to look for ways to engage with people. Look for ways to have meaningful conversations with people. Past just, hey, how are you doing? Because typically when we ask that question, we really don't want to hear the answer. Because if we hear the answer, it might require us having a conversation. Maybe giving them a hug. Maybe showing them love. And the conversation is going to take longer than 30 seconds. We're hoping that they say, doing great. Glad to be here. Better than I deserve. There's a lot of good ones. But we're hoping for the quick one. But that's not sharing the love of God. That's not loving your neighbor as yourself. I'm coming as hard as I am this morning because... I've been dealing with myself for months. I've been beating myself up for it, so it's just all coming out now. we got to get better at it, guys. If we want to see the baptismal tank getting filled with water and people getting baptized, we got to get better at loving God. we got to get better at loving our neighbor as ourselves. Everybody stand with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Love Gary, come play. A song of invitation. I don't know where you're at in your walk with God. I can't see your heart, but God can. And he's been working on you. You know how I know? Because his gospel was presented. And when the word of God, the gospel presentation is presented, it affects the heart of the hearer. You might be trying to block it out. You might be trying to ignore it. You might be trying to hold it down like a beach ball underwater. But he's talking to you. He's pointing out things that you need to do. He's pointing out ways that you can love him and love your neighbor better. Don't ignore it. Don't run from God. If you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior, if you've never put your faith and trust in him as your Savior, do not leave today without doing that. If you have trusted Jesus as your Savior, but you haven't been loving God and loving your neighbor the way you should, you know it. God's dealing with you. God's not here to shame you or to make you feel bad about yourself, but he does convict. He does show you things in your heart that are wrong, but he doesn't leave it there. He shows you how to fix it too. He wants a relationship with you. He desires a relationship with you. 
So take a few moments. If you want to come down front here, come down front and pray. The altar is always open. Sometimes it requires some movement to get moving. But do business with the Lord. Take a few moments. All right. Well, thank you for coming this morning. Thank you for being with us. We enjoyed having you. If you do need to talk, I'll be here. I'd love to talk to you. Uh, there are lots of people around that would also love to talk to you. But I do encourage you to not leave without talking to somebody if you need to talk to somebody. Come back tonight, 5 o'clock, Romans chapter 8. Good news, no condemnation. That's what the book of Romans chapter 8 starts out with. No condemnation for those that have accepted, accepted Christ. So looking forward to that Bible study. Um, be back tonight at 8, and then we'll have the snack time after church, uh, and then taking down some decorations. So we'll go ahead and dismiss in a word of prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your gospel message. We thank you that the word has gone out. I just pray that you would be with everybody this morning as they go their separate ways, that they would go with your love, Lord, that they would share your love with, them, with their neighbors, with the people around them, so that they could love others the way that you would have them love them. Thank you for all that you've done for us. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. Amen.